Howdy folks, it's Meandering Mike in the Man Cave of Madness. It is the middle of the afternoon, and it's on Memorial Day, and we are doing a how to play and playthrough of Wizard Kings. This is from Columbia Game. Do note that this is uh, a game that I received a review copy of. Uh, I did an unboxing of that. This is not the actual review copy. This is a used copy that I have that already was stickered. I'm going to be giving away the review copy that I received. It's been opened, but is not, will not have been played, will not uh, be stickered or anything like that. So it'll be in a sort of its near pristine condition. Uh, <laughs> the copy that I ca have came with extra blocks. And I haven't verified yet if it's missing blocks. I did verify that for this scenario that I'm doing, it's elves versus undead. Here are the eight standard blocks that come from the elven army in this Wizard King's second edition. There's seven armies with eight blocks per army. And here's the undead ones. Now, the elves start with, I believe, five of these armies and can build three more. The undead start with six of these armies and cannot build the other ones in this scenario. Um, there are expansions for this game, and I believe some of those are in the box th that I have, but I'm not playing with those. Um, and so this is a nice learning scenario uh, with a small subset of the units, just two of the armies, not even their full army. Now, one thing to note that, okay, this is the rule book that came with this used version. It is version 2.0. Here is the rule book that came with the what I got the review copy. It is also version 2.0, you can see on the corner. However, this down here is copyright 2007. This is when the game came out. Basically, I think at the end of 2006, it had a copyright date of 2007. This one has been updated. It's 2013. However, However, there is a rata out there on BoardGameGeek that is not in either of these versions. They did not update this with a rata. In fact, there's a like a, a typo in this that they didn't fix in here. Now, that is a nitpicking issue. That's that's not a big deal. But this is an example of there are some things that did not change that you know could have, should have. Uh, you can obviously see a difference here. That here's a blank spot, and here they meant to include a picture. One of each of the different seven armies, the colors of the blocks, and the stickers on the front. Now, that is explained on the second page of the rule book here. Oh, that's the right here, it says, these different armies have these different color blocks. So that lets you know, you know which one to put on which colors, but it's nice to see it right here. Uh, another minor difference, this is in black and white, this is in color. Now, the scenario we are playing is called Island of the Dead. It says right here, for your first game, we recommend Island of the Dead, Solitaire Scenario, Scenario 7.1. And you go to this back here in the scenarios, and lo and behold, there it is, Island of the Dead, Scenario 7.1. However, <laughs> for some strange, bizarre reason... In this version that's still 2.0, but it came out in 2013, it says the same thing here. Go to 7.1, but when you go back here, you do not find Island of the Dead at Scenario 7.1. Instead, you find what is called Last Wizard Standing. Between this version and this version, they just rearranged the order of scenarios in the front, did not change it in the back. Now... I'm going to stick with the fact that up front on both of these, they say best to do 7.1, and I agree, because when I look at this scenario, Last Wizard Standing, I do not think this is a good scenario to play, attempt to play as your first scenario. There's no normal building in this scenario. <laughs> there's, there's, there's only the wizard gets to heal, and you don't get to build or replace your armies. That's a, a core part of the game. And so, yes, stick with 
I live in the dead scenario, and whether in your rule book it's 7.3 or 7.1 as it is here, find the island of the dead scenario and play it first. It's designed to be played solitaire. You can play it with two players, but it's on a, it's a one mapper instead of two or more, and it is uh, the perfect starting place in my mind. Basically, it's like a puzzle. The undead are going to play by scripted rules for how they move and attack and how they build. Basically, you're in charge of the elves and you have a puzzle to solve. You need to conquer the castle. The undead castle is going to be here. The elves are going to start here. And we'll, we'll get that all set up for you. Now, do note that the elves do have spells. So you'll have to learn the, the spell system. One thing to note in the rules this will they talk about wizards. Now, this unit here, and we'll talk about what these all mean, but it's a Wakana. This is the elven wizard. Every wizard has a either an A plus or a B plus value here. In the, the normal standard game, they're only A pluses. You can find in the expansion, allegedly, B pluses. Okay. They're both wizards and each army type has a different name for their wizard. So the undead, Necrom, short for Necromancer, Wakana. These are wizards. They're both wizards. The undead are not going to use that. They're not going to use that one. They get only six different armies. So it's going to be simple. You get to learn how to do the elf's magic. Here are their spells. There's some things about these spells that they don't really tell you directly you got to sort of figure it out and i'll explain that to you okay so we're gonna set this aside now what i'm gonna do is i'm gonna set up the units where they start and then we'll talk about their values and the units are set up now one thing to note i have them standing up on their edge this is normally how you play wizards king a block game but in a two or more player game, you have the front facing you and the back facing the enemy. They don't get to know what's where. When you're playing solitaire, you either keep them up on their edges like this, but just facing you, the player, or you lie them flat like this. Now, I'm not sure what's going to be easier for you to see. I think it might be this way. And plus, when they're on their edge, it's easier to fit multiple guys. Now, there is stacking limits in these hexes. And normally, in the clear, it's four. And if there's a city, it's one higher. So there can be five in a city in the clear. The stacking for things like desert and forest and marsh... Swamp, as they call it, which is not on this particular map, those have a lesser stacking value. Now, in the rule book, there's a chart here that tells you how many can stack in a hex. In the sea or lake, four, clear, desert and woods is three, swamp is two, mountain is two, however, and then city adds plus one. Mountain you cannot normally enter, mountain hexes unless you specifically have the ability. There's certain units like dwarves that have, you know, mountain folk. Now, these different armies in the game have a mix of things. These elves, some are forest folk and some are flyers. These undead, some are swamp dwellers and some are desert dwellers. So their, their special ability... now. The guys that are swamp depth dwellers are called amphibians. So believe it or not, these zombies are amphibians. All right? That means not only can they go in the swamp, but they can cross rivers, go into lake squares, they can move along coastal, but they can't cross all water hex sides. Now, there are no swamps on this map, but there are rivers. They can cross the rivers with no problem. The skeletons with the little palm tree, those are desert folk. And they can move through desert hexes. 
Otherwise, anyone else has to stop in the desert. Forest folk can move through forests. Otherwise, you have to stop in the forest. Mountains are a little different. You can't enter the mountains normally at all, unless you're a mountain folk. Exceptions are flyers. Flyers can pass through no problem. Technically, they're not supposed to land there, but they can end their square there. They can fight other flyers there. They're just not really landing there. So that's kind of one of those rules that's explained, but not really well explained. Um, okay. You can see these brown lines. Those are roads. Those affect movement. Uh, we'll explain that. Um, and if you, if you were very observant on this chart, you will have noticed that besides hex, there's a hex side limit. Now, this hex limit is in force for when you move at the end of your move. Now, it's possible each player can have up to this many because everyone moves and then you have combat. So it's not I go, you go. It's I go, move, you go, move. Then we all go, boom, in combat. Okay, now That's true whether you're two players, three, five, seven, whatever. So if you have a seven-player game, everyone's going to move first and then whatever combats have been created. All combats are in hex. You can't shoot or melee or cast spells. No, asterisks. There, there are some movement spells that you cast that, that will... will Leave the effect of the hex that you're in. In other words, you can cast like a... The elves are going to cast a fly spell on a unit, and then that guy's going to fly out of there. All right? Um, there are not normally combat spells that blast outside of hexes. However, there are summon-type spells where you can bring guys that are not in the hex that you're going to do battle in can bring them in. Okay? This is not all carefully explained. This is one of the things about these rules that they're kind of light, they're not big. You can piece together most of this, but there are some confusions. Uh, some stuff is, like I said, is cleared up in errata. Some stuff, questions people had, the answer didn't really clear them up. Um, and there's a lot of people that house rule this game. You know, for my, my for my reading, especially between first and second edition, which I plan on eventually doing a compare and contrast. I mean, we are playing second edition rules. There's a couple of major differences that I've, read about. I have not read the first edition rules yet, so but we will later at some point do a basic, almost a rule-by-rule rule comparison to see what's different. Now, back to what I was talking about here. These hex side limits affect you during movement if you are entering a hex that has any units in it. If you are entering a hex where you are already in it, or it's empty, which are basically the definition of friendly and neutral hexes. If you already have units in a hex, it's friendly to you. You move more in there. There's no effect of these hex sides other than not listed on here. You can't cross river unless you're amphibious. It doesn't say that here. It should. Um, but this is a limitation if you're moving into an enemy hex. So even though a clear can support four guys in it, so you could move up to four guys into the hex to be able to attack. However, per any clear hex side, you can only cross it into combat with two guys. And this is true with these other things that are limited to three and two in the hex. They're limited to one crossing the hex side. So what that means, if we look here at this desert, this is a desert hex. There can be no more than three guys of each side in it, actually. And that's of each side. There's a whole special rule about multiple players fighting the battle in a space and people have to basically side up with one side or the other. The original guy, the attacking guy, and anyone else comes in must side with one or the other and then you have to obey those stacking limits. So there's not going to be potentially 21 armies in here, you know, each of seven armies moving in with three. Not possible. Really not possible because of the hex limits. So this is a desert. It can have three in it. Let's say, for example, this guy is here 
and the elves have I'm gonna move some some dudes around here. All right. One guy here. These guys want to attack him. This can only support three armies. So he's by himself. One, that's fine. They can go in there with three if they can get in there. But this is a desert hexide. That's a desert hexide. You can only move one in through here, one in through here. Okay. They couldn't get in there unless they had a flyer. All wizards are flyers. Some other units are flyers. These pixies are flyers. When you have a flying unit, you ignore the hex side limit. You can fly in in addition to a guy marching in. So I'm going to put uh, a set of dudes here. And this can easily happen in the game. This is this is a thing that might happen. These elves start here. They come up and they end up taking this. And now they're wanting to push forward. Well, this this set of elves. Uh, da -da, da -da, da -da, I want to put now. This is legal. Clear train four plus one for the city. Five guys can be in here. How can we attack this with the most possible? We can only get three in there. If we want to go in with ground units, we got uh, a ranger and a glader. Only one could come through here. So let's say we. Move the glader in here. The ranger could go down to here and to here. This is clear hex side. He wouldn't have to stop. When they come into the desert, they're going to have to stop. These are forest folks. They're not desert folk. They're going to have to stop. But this guy goes into here and he has to stop. And only one that could have entered there. The ranger has a two movement allowance. So does he. But he can go to this clear terrain here first and then enter this way. So he's sort of flanking around. And he'd have to stop. He'd have to stop anywhere because he only has two movement points. But this is how we get two ground units in here to attack. Now, is that the most we can do? Well, no. Pixies fly. Wicana flies. These pixies could just fly straight in. They don't have to go fly this way or this way. Doesn't matter. For hex side limits, flyers do not count. Okay? So they just fly on in. So, oh, boop, 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 boop. And let's say maybe we want this Wakana in there the cast spells or maybe we we decide you know this guy's it now stop because uh they could all enter there because i got flyers and they're not limited in, no this would be bad if you did this and the guy said are you done moving are you sure bam supposedly you have to eliminate units to get you down to the proper stacking now don't be that guy. If, if, if someone doesn't like, look, you're overstacked. Oh, just point it out and let them correct. Okay. Oh, oh yeah. I'm not going to go in with everybody. I'm only going with these three. Okay. If someone keeps doing it and <laughs> you say, look, look, you can't overstack. And I keep warning you, you know, we're going to start playing that if you do it, I'm going to eliminate your excess. Okay. But you know, still be nice and point it out. <laughs> you're overstacked. You're overstacked. Um, eventually the person will get it, but. So this is an example of we are having three in here in attack. How did we get in there? We split up one crossing here, one crossing here, one flying in, and these three guys will attack this one. All right? So that is the basics of movement into combat and the limitations of the hexes and the hex sides. There are places where, like, oh, you can't cross a river, but there's a bridge. A bridge can support one guy moving in. There's a river here and a river here. You can't normally cross it except at a bridge or if you're an amphibious unit. There's some uh, rules about the source of a river where if you have moved into the hex, then you can then move down the other side. This does not really make sense in these two hexes in, in single-length river hexes doesn't make sense. There's there's no really way that you would move up this way and then down. You can't move into the mountains. And to go all this way down around here to go into the clear, that doesn't really make sense that you could move from here to here, getting around this river this way. Uh, I'm telling you, it does not make sense. So there are some places where people have said, you know, there these rules are kind of loosey-goosey. And it makes sense in some of their examples where they show where you can see 
you know, that, well, it's clear here and here and how, how you would move. That makes sense. But I'm declaring for this scenario that there's no way it makes sense to be able to be on this side and say, I'm moving from here to here, saying, oh, I'm going up around the source and down this way. No, it's this is the river. It's supposed to block you here. And same with here to here or here to here. Here's the mouth of that may be the source, but like, no, nah, you know, you're not supposed to go from here to here or here to here this way. You know, you've, you've got a road to come out. That makes sense. Um, but this mountains are, 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 are in the way. So this river here, here, they're sacrosanct. <laughs> they're, they're, they're there. Now the zombie, a zombie here, cause a zombie is a amphibious unit. He could move out this way. There's no zombies that start here, but one could end up getting built there. We're going to talk about that next. So let me reset up. So we are set up again, and I want to remind you uh, that not all the units for the elves start on the board. They've got some guys over here, and it does say specifically in the scenario that they can build additional gladers or a castle. Now, the elves are on attack. They need to kill the undead castle by the end of turn 10. So you say, well, why would the elves want to build a castle? Well, map control. Cities that you start with. So these undead start with five cities, and the elves start with two. Okay. Cities that you start with are friendly to you throughout the game. The enemy takes them, you lose them, and they maintain control, as long as they're still garrisoning them. If they leave, you gain control back. Now, these undead will never capture over here. The, the movement, the program movement of the undead, they're not going to cross the water. They can't cross the water. They have no ability to cross the, f the full water. You need, you need uh, aquatic units or flying units. They do not have aquatic units or flying units. Now, the undead normally has available to a Necrom, their wizard that flies, they do not in this scenario. Uh, their, their three strength movement, that's that's another uh, amphibious dude, not an aquatic. These cannot cross full sea. So elves don't need to garrison these. They can keep earning their money in these cities and build things, but they're going to need to get a foothold. They're going to need to take cities here. And that's a reason why the elf might want to build a castle at some point is so they can leave with all their units, but leave a castle behind to keep it garrisoned so that they can keep building troops there. Um, but normally they're going to want to build their other troops first. They're more useful. Okay. And I want to remind you again about where the undead set up is very important to get the zombies and the skeletons in the right places, okay? The skeletons are supposed to be here. The skeletons are the guy that are the desert folk. And it's important that this guy here be able to cross this desert to attack here. And if you had, like, mixed them up at the start here, this zombie could not cross that desert. You'd have to stop. And the way the undead are programmed to move, they're going to try to attack the nearest elves but only if they can get there that turn. So if there's elves here, this guy would want to go over and attack, but he won't if he'd have to stop there. So now, so let's see. Eventually, there could be a zombie here. That's because this skeleton here might go to attack, and we'd be fighting, and they lose the city, and then later, a zombie could be built here. And then that would apply that this a zombie here will not try to attack way over here because it has to stop in the desert and therefore, it's programmed to move by the rules of this scenario for solitaire play is the undead will only attack the nearest elf if it can reach it. All right. Important thing to note, we talked about roads. On a road, if you start on a road and end on a road, you get to move one hex farther. So a zombie here... This is two X's away, but that's desert. So he couldn't go there and get in. This, he couldn't cross here. This is 
wide open water. You need an aquatic, not an amphibious. So we can't go here and in. But there's this road that snakes this way. So this guy, if, if the elves are in here, he could go one, two, three. He can follow the road and make it in here. Now, one thing to notice that when you're crossing a bridge, the bridge hexide limit is one. So if there were two undead here and there was these elven units here, only one of these guys could make it in. They couldn't both do this because of this limit moving into a hex where you're going to have combat. Now, I got to say this right now. There's some places where they talk about combat hexes, and sometimes they talk about battle hexes. There are places in this rule book where battle hex is put in bold. I think there's like four times. However, they never define battle hex officially, okay? This is one of those things where they were trying to write nice short rules, and eh, it was a little too terse. A little, they should have used more words. They should have put the scenarios like in a separate two-page folder that could have had more scenarios. A battle hex, a combat hex, just means here's a hex with units in it. Someone has moved in. There's going to be fighting in there. And every time they refer to combat hex or battle hex, that's what it is. Some place where there's already units that are going to fight battle. Remember, you move first. Everyone moves. And then you have combat. So it's, it's like a potential hex where battles are going to happen. And then once you've moved in there, you're going to have some battle. Okay? I'm going to explain some things in a, in a second. But so if this guy has moved in, one of the things they recommend is that in this scenario, just move the undead one unit at a time. If you just always move it one unit at a time, this will clear out most of your questions. So if this guy says, okay, am I within range? Yeah. What's the nearest? He's there the nearest. One, two, three. I can move in. Now this guy... What's the nearest? Well, they're the nearest, but I can't move in because that's three away across a bridge I can no longer cross, okay? This is, we've exceeded the hexide limit. So for this turn, he has to stay there. He's not going to move to here and wait. If they cannot make it into the combat, they don't go. Now, if there's an elf here, we started like this, they would both go to here. That's one away. They can both cross this. Because there's, there's two. Now, let's say there was three skeletons here. We move two of them in. This other one can still move in because he could go this way. It's now two away, but that's still the nearest he could reach. This is three away along the road. They would team up here. Okay, So that's the rule. Now, see, I'm, I'm needing to put these back the right way. <laughs> this is the problem. If uh, whoop, 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 whoop. Skeleton, skeleton, zombie, zombie, zombie. Oops, I've already done it wrong, right? Skeleton. <laughs> zombie. Zombie, zombie. All right. Let me double check that. So this this is the important first battle spot. This is this is the only place that really makes sense for the elves to try to, to land on their invasion. Um they're gonna get they're gonna get attacked by the skeletons when they do it, but uh let's see, Bethy and Anzar. Yeah, so here's Anzar. That's the Anzari Desert, but this is the town called Anzar. Uh, Baven, Bethy, this is where the castle is. Now, one thing to notice, we haven't, I haven't, I haven't talked about this yet. And some of you might've caught it meandering, Mike, you're doing it wrong. I have all these things face up so that you can read them, that you can see the name of them. Okay. This is like a block game. This is a Columbia block game. There's these diamonds around the side. Some people call those pips. Some people call them strength. Some people call them steps. Some people uh, call them hits in the phrase of hit to kill. They're in these rules. <laughs> they're places there for the hits. That's really damage against someone's steps. Uh, they mostly call them in here steps. And a lot of you that are hex and counter illusion like a step loss, and you have a counter and you flip it over. That's one. And or maybe you've got a marker that you put on to see how many step losses have been taken or something. In the block world, you whirl the block around. So if this is like this, I'm going to get it closer. It's ever on the top. That's how strong you are. So this is 
Three. And again, I want to see the strength. This is the problem room. How many steps you have. This number up here is your combat rating. A letter and a number. They all have a letter and a number. <clears throat> Except for wizards, they have a letter and a plus sign. Okay? That is the sign of a wizard. An A plus or a B plus. Everything else will either be A, B, C. There are actually some Ds, but not in the basic armies, the, the standard armies in the second edition. A, B, C is your... Mm, some games you call it a strike rank, <laughs> like in RuneQuest. Some people would call it initiative, except we're not going to call it initiative because initiative is determined who will move phase move first, okay? So this is like your strike speed, who goes first. Now, I'm going to say shoot a lot, who shoots first. All, all combat is in hex, remember? Now, some guys are range type guys, like the rangers are shooting a bow and whatnot. It doesn't matter. It's, it's like when it's your turn to attack, you roll dice to attack and see if you get any hits. There's no n notion of ranged combat per se. But you can you can extrapolate the fact that this ranger is shooting, <clears throat> attacking first because he's a ranged unit. They shoot bows. They're fast. They're elves. They're going to go A's go before B's. B's go before C's. C's go before D. Now, if you got a plus, you go before the other guy. So a Wakana wizard, A plus, will have an opportunity to do magic before someone like a ranger and a two unit. Okay? But in combat, all A's would shoot, shoot attack. First, I'm going to say it over and over. I shoot first, then B's will go, then C's will go. What if there's more than one unit at the same letter? Okay, the defender at the same letter gets to do his attacks before the attacker. So there's an advantage to sitting back and defending. However, there's an advantage to moving first and initiating attacks because you can pin guys. When you move in to a hex with one or more units and then you're done with all your movement, for each army you moved in there, you're pinning one of their units. The defender gets to decide. In a sense, they have to leave people behind that are engaging the enemy. Okay? On a one-for-one -one basis, and anyone excess can move out and around. Okay? So that can be very important that... Uh, Things can happen of a strange, weird nature, uh, especially when you don't know what the blocks are in a normal thing where they're, they're hidden, you haven't revealed them yet, everyone moves, and then you're going to reveal and you have combat. You're not sure if it's some weak little dude, some strong little dude. You know, what does he have? He's got three in there. I only got two guys, but yours might be way stronger. They might be way weaker. You don't know. And people might maneuver around to like try to cut off retreats or do things. So it's much, much, much more chaotic when you're playing the full fog of war when these would be turned around. Like the enemy, you'd only see the back. And the elves would be like, okay, I'm not sure what's here. Now, in this scenario, you know exactly what they set up. It's all solitaire. You just expose everything. And you don't worry about uh, hidden movement in the solitaire way. You can play this game completely exposed fog of war if you want to. That could be a house rule. You say... Uh, I don't want to deal with, you know, hidden movement. Let's just play it face up. Most people don't do that. I think they like the block games because of the hidden movement. But if you were, for example, teaching a younger player how to play this game, you might want to the first time, you know, besides like, here, let's have them do this. You could do this together cooperatively. Um, you might have your initial other games and let's, let's just keep everything face up so we know what's going on. And then later say, okay, introduce the, the normal way to play with Fog of War. All right. So we we're talking about the pips and the strengths. Now, one odd thing about this is, you know, where's the one pip? Where's the one diamond? Where's the one step? Well, that's always the top. Okay. When the name is at the top this represents one okay 
Now, my first reaction to that, I don't like that at all. To me, my, my reaction is, I want the strongest to have the, the picture upright. I want all the numbers to be able to read, because that's that to me is the default state. I, this, is, this is what I want. I want to be at max strength, and I want to see all those numbers at max strength. Now, that's not the way they do it here, and you're going to get used to it. I've played this game once, and I'm starting to get used to it, but my first reaction is, oh, I don't like that at all. I want the max on the top, not the weakest. Okay, you will get used to it. <laughs> um, and the fact that when you buy a new unit, you recruit somebody, you know, you start at the first step. This number here is the gold cost to build. It's to per step. So if you want to bring in and have a four-step zombie, you'd pay four gold. Okay, you bring it in for one and you can pump it up. So depending on how much gold you have, often you might only have one. So you you bring it in, and the next turn you could leave it there and grow. But if it's moved off to fight, well, it won't be staying behind to grow. But in this scenario, there are rules for when the undead move and when, you know, if they're sitting on a city that they can they can they can beef up and grow. Um, we'll talk about that shortly. All right. Now let me get ready for the next stage. All right, so now what we have set up since we're talking about steps, the pips, and the orientation, this is how the scenario is supposed to be set up. Each of the undead units has two steps, two pips, the two parts up. The castle, each skeleton, the three zombies, they all have two pips. The elves, it varies. This glader up here at Gurundi just has one pip. The rest of these guys are at full strength. The Wakan is at four. The Rangers are at three. Each Pixie is at three. These guys are the strike force. They're ready to go. Now the question is, how do they get over here to here? These guys are forest folks. Well, they have some flyers. They don't have any aquatics. They cannot sail. However, there is a notion of sea transport. We're not going to go into that this turn because you cannot sea transport into an enemy port. You can see transport between two friendly ports. So once the elves capture Baven, then we'll show you how to see transport. All right, so let's actually get started. And we haven't even told you how the combat's actually resolved. We will do that as we go along. I mean, you've been saying, meandering Mike, get to it. I wanna see some action. All right, the first thing I'm gonna do is I say, hey, I got pixies. Pixies can fly. Now again, I gotta turn it over here so you can see. Hopefully you can see that. That's a little wings, red wings. They're two. They have a movement allowance of two, and they're flyers. Okay? Flyers can go across the water. Flyers can cross anything. All right? Now, again, this is in the clear. It's a city. There can be up to five guys attacking. You can have five defenders. You can have five attackers. And we don't care about the hexide limit with flyers. That is the rule. Remember that flyers do not count against hex side limits. Okay? So for this attack, we don't care where we're coming from. We don't have to fly around this way or fly around that way. For flying attack, it doesn't matter. Okay? Now, so they're going to fly into here because we want to try to beat them up. Now, pixies are not really strong. They have a B. Now, I mentioned the, the B means Bs shoot after As, but before Cs. This skeleton is a C1. So I'm going to be turning this around to show you, and I have to remember to turn them to the right spot. C1. Okay. C1s. Every army, every, you know, player army, undeads, dwarves, orcs, elves, etc., has a C1 unit. They only cost one gold per step. They call these cannon fodder or arrow fodder. Now, there are no cannons that I know of in this game, so... Arrow fodder, fodder is the appropriate term. They're cheap units. They're important to have in your army to take losses against. And we'll explain that when we do the combat. But they, they don't have a high firepower number, that one. And we'll sh show how that works. But And they also shoot, shoot, melee, fight, last. Okay, that's it. Two steps. <laughs> so these are B1s. They're not very much stronger. 
but we do have two blocks of three steps each, and they do get to shoot first. So these pixies are much powerful than this zombie here, but, but <laughs> we, we want to ensure that we wipe this dude out. We want to take this place. We do not want to fail. So I can fly my wizard over here? Nope, not going to do that. <laughs> now, magic costs the actual life essence of the wizard steps. Each spell, this number on the side, the quote-unquote spell level, that is the cost in steps, pips. You have to put damage on the casting wizard. This, again, so Wakana is the, the, the name of the block. But that's that is a wizard block type. It costs these amount of stuff. So if we're gonna cast a thunder shock or a lightning spell, it's gonna cost one. If we want to blast them with a fork lightning, it'll cost two, etc. We're not gonna do that right now. There'll be times when that's important, but not right now. One of the things about magic in Wizard Kings, and you gotta remember this because I've seen people play it wrong, they forget. These spells that do a certain number of dice at a certain firepower cannot kill off a block. They can damage them. They can take multiple steps off them. They can weaken blocks down from four down to one, but they cannot take the last pip. They cannot eliminate it. So, you know, this two-step zombie could be reduced down to one, but if the wizard came in and blasted a big, huge spell and rolled four dice and got... Four hits, it still doesn't kill it. The guy would only take one pip damage at most. So we're not going to cast magic to do blasting in this fight. What we're going to do is we're going to use this fly spell. This is a movement phase spell. Not every army has movement phase spells. If it doesn't say it's not a movement phase spell, all these spells here normally are only cast in combat, in a battle hex, at the turn of the wizard, they can elect to do one of these or not, or they can pass. You don't necessarily want to always cast magic because it does make you lose steps. But right now, we want to get <laughs> this ranger. This ranger is a beautiful A2. It shoots first and has a two strength. Yummy. All right. So we got three steps worth of A2 ranger. So what you got to do to cast a movement spell is the wizard themselves cannot move. They have to do it in their movement turn and then not move. Okay, I've seen people make that mistake. Okay, You can't move and cast a movement spell. You can move and cast a combat spell, but you can't move and cast a movement spell. You have to sit here, cast your movement spell, and not move at all. Now, this is totally fine because uh, we don't mind sitting here, staying here. There's this... Uh, gold that's going to be generated by the city and eventually we're going to want to replenish this wizard okay so we might stay here for two turns we might fly in it depends on what happens here but it's not a big deal right now uh moving that we're not moving away from it. so we're going to cast the flight spell in movement we have to go down this guy started with four st steps it's down to a three now we're casting the flight spell. This guy now has fly, okay? But we have to read this carefully. It says, one friendly unit in the wizard hex may fly a die six hexes. Castles may not fly, okay? So if you've built a castle, castles have zero movement. You can't then let a castle fly. No, 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 not allowed. Cast only the movement phase. So we're going to roll a die here. Okay, I've got dice tower over here. I roll a two. Okay, only two hexes. That's fine for right now. Uh... Because I really only got to go one here. I want to get him to fly across over to here. I don't want him to go, you know, technically he can go all the way here and he can attack the castle. I can try to win on the first turn. Mm, would I win on the first turn? <sighs> Probably not. <laughs> I'm going to explain why in a second. But I'm going to fly in here. We're going to beat the snot out of this guy here. We sh absolutely should win. We might take a loss or two for unlucky. But odds are we'll probably not take a loss. We're lucky we'll kill this guy and not take a loss. Okay. Now, we talked about 
the fact that these undead are programmed. They have a rule how they move, okay? Now, normally, when you play Wizard Kings, you roll two dice. Each player rolls two dice at the start of the movement phase, and the highest die roll will have the initiative, okay? They're player one. And then clockwise from there, it's player two, three, four, five, six. So, so each turn, who is player one and seven players will, will vary. I mean, you could win the initiative twice in a row, and you'll be player one, two turns in a row, but it's always clockwise. It's not like... We're going to go and you, you, then you, then you, then you. If you're playing with seven players, it's just whoever rolled highest. Now, if you get a tie between the people that rolled highest, they dice off. Okay? So you roll who's highest. If there's a tie for those, they dice off. And then whoever got you know that, that win is player one. It goes here. Now, this scenario, this scenario, the rule is elves are always player one. Undead, always player two. The undead will always move after the elves. Remember, combat combat happens in the combat phase after both players have moved. But which battles are resolved first, and the orders can be important for purposes of where can you retreat or not, we will, we will talk about that probably in a subsequent when there's more than one battle. All right? Um, but so this is our move. Now, this guy here, he cannot, well, he could see move. We could see move to here, okay? There's a reason why I'm not going to do that, and that's because this city has gold value. This guy's only at one pip right now, one, one step, and I might want to sit there a couple turns to build up. These arrow fodder guys are most useful when they have their four strength. And the reason that is, is we're going to have combat here soon, but you take losses against the unit with the most pips, the most steps. That is the priority. You always assign damage to the guys with the highest, unless there is some targeting. There are some spells that say, quote, unquote, they're targeted, that the wizard goes zap a particular block, and that block must take the losses if the spell generates any damage. Otherwise, it goes off of the thing. Right now, these pixies and these rangers, they all have the same three strength. So, if this one strength guy was in here, he wouldn't be able to help take a loss, because the damage would go against one of these. They're all three. You could elect to take it on the pixies, because they're cheaper than the, yes, the Rangers cost four gold per step. Very, very expensive to have an A unit with more, you know, A2 is is expensive. All right. So I'm going to leave the Glader here. He's not going to see move to here. I have already have this wizard sitting here that's now at three steps. I may leave him here a couple turns to fill up, or I may say, you know, mm, I might fly him in here next turn. The fact this city has a two, and I might start to say, ah, let me replenish from over here. We'll just have to figure out what, depending on what happens here. All right, so 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 for this move, the elves are done. They cast a spell, the Wakana, allowed the ranger to fly over. The pixies flew over. This guy Lex to ooh, <laughs> not move. He'll sit there for the build phase that has after the combat phase. Okay, so now we do this combat? No, we don't do this combat yet. Okay? Because everybody moves and then you do combat. So, this block is pinned. This block is not going to move. Right? These three guys could pin up to three units here. Now, pinning, pinning has nothing to do with flying or not. If this was a flyer and there was no flyers here, this guy would still be pinned. Okay? It's for every enemy that's in there, one of your guys is pinned. Now, if it was the other way, let's say if this guy had moved in here and then the elves were going first. This is hypothetical. Because remember, the undead always moves last in this scenario. But if he'd moved in, he would pin one of these guys, the 
defender, the guy who's moving second, can choose which guy is being pinned. And what it really means is which guy is facing the enemy. So if this ranger faced this enemy, these guys could fly out of the hex in their turn. Okay, Or I might say, well, no, I want one pixie to do that, and this guy might move somewhere else, and this guy might fly somewhere, whatever. Or they're all going to stay there. It just depends. That's part of the tactical choices. Uh, the thing is, in a normal game, a normal fight, you don't know what's in there. You only know how many. You know how many guys are going to be pinned or how many guys have to stay behind. Okay, but in this case, they move in. The elves are always going to be the attacker, but not. <laughs> and 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 we'll, we'll explain why. The undead will move to attack. Okay, so right now, the elves moved in here. They're the attacker. We're going to end up moving some undead into here. They're going to support this but they're on defense. The elf is the attacker, but more guys can come in. If the, let's say, let's say this wizard had not cast the fly spell, he stayed there and he flew to over here. This guy would attack. He'd become the attacker. He'd be the defender. And we'd have a battle like that. This would be a dumb move. Yes, it would be a dumb move. There, there's no, no reason to do this really. Say, well, I want to lure him forward and I want to blast him with my wizard and kill him. Well, again, you can't kill him. Now, technically, there is a reason you might do this because this guy is going to move into here too. This guy, well, th this guy's already here. This guy's going to move in. Okay, remember what we said about a skeleton? Skeleton's got the palm tree. He's desert folk. He can cross this desert. What's the nearest elves? These guys. Can he get there in one turn? One, two. He can because he's a desert folk. He can cross this. And Zari Desert doesn't have to stop. If he wasn't a desert folk, he wouldn't attack. And that was that whole thing. You got to make sure that this is a skeleton because that's what the rules say. The skeleton starts here and here. Zombies are there. So this skeleton here is going to move in. And this zombie here that's two away. Well, he can't go across the river here. He can't go here. He'd have to stop, in the, but he can go along the road. One, two, three, across the bridge. So this is what's going to happen. These guys are too far away. One, two, three, four, five, six. <laughs> and that, that bridge has already been exceeded. These guys are going to sit there and not move at all. They don't move up to here. They don't move up to here. They just stay where they are. That is the nature of this scenario. Okay? So... I'm going to quickly talk to you about, there's an optional rule called Combat Reserves. In the optional rule, which I have not played with yet, I'm going to, my understanding is this guy coming in and this guy coming in would not engage in the first round of combat. We'd have this fight, and then, depending what happens here, these guys would show up, and we'd continue the battle from there. I'm not playing with that rule. That's an optional rule. I will play with it later to see what the difference is. But right now, he was there. These elves moved in. These guys can move in. These guys can move in. It's going to be a three-on-three -three fight. That seems pretty tense. Now, you know these elves have three steps each, and these are some pretty good units. they got Bs and As. But you got there. So this, you know, the undead could roll well. The elves could roll bad. Could be, you know, disaster. <laughs> or hopefully they will take this space. Now, I'm going to tell you something about the rules of this game here in just a second. But for now, i got to... Sign off to go watch a live stream. All right, we're back at this. We've completed of turn one, the movement of the elves here, which included a fly spell. And Pixie's flying over. The unit that was in there of the undead was pinned. The undead that was here and here by their rules of the undead rules of engagement, they will try to attack the nearest elf as long as they can reach it in one turn. If they cannot reach it, they will stay where they are. Okay. And we ignore these guys across the way. They're 
Now, these are only two away, but they can't go by sea. These are two away, but they couldn't go through the desert. This guy was a, I mean, they couldn't go here and across. This full sea hexide, but this guy could go via the road. And this guy being a skeleton could go through the desert. So now the combat. So I'm going to, we're going to remember that it's here. I'm going to move the pieces closer and spread them out here so we can see them. Now, if you're playing this game, you know, with the hidden movement, one side would be able to see their blocks, their side would be facing the other direction and you would, you would, flop him down to show the other guy and he'd be flocking him this way and you sort of be looking at your tiles normally but his upside down and that's uh, another issue for like well so personally i like the idea of rotating them to show them to them and then rotating them back to yourself um we're we're, we're having them all exposed so we know for us playing solitaire that they're, 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 they're face up. Now I'm gonna put the elves back here and the undead here first. Now I hope there's not too much glare on that. If I laid them down like this, maybe this might look a little wowsy, then that guy gets all glary. <laughs> we have three two-step units, okay? Two of them are zombies, one of them is skeleton. The zombies are C1s. Skeleton's a C2. They're all Cs. They don't shoot until the C time. And over here, we have two pixies of three steps each, which are Bs. And again, right now, that's upside down. I'm not going to flip them over. I'm going to stop flipping things around because I'm going to lose track as we start taking losses. So you're going to have to bear with me. This is what you have to do in the game, <laughs> deal with things upside down. So they're B1s, and this is an A2. So he attacks first. If there was a wizard in the space, being an A+, plus, they would do a spell. But I elected to have this guy cast the fly spell instead of flying over herself to blast the spell in here. Now, some people might want to try the other alternative. Um, I, I like the idea of getting the, <laughs> the ranger over here and then potentially flying in later or maybe hanging out here to to recruit and regroup, etc. But we, we will see. All right. So we're going to start with the elf ranger. Now, as an A2, you roll one die per pip, per step. So the first thing we're going to do is this guy's going shoot, to shoot, shoot him. In his case, we're assuming he's a range, but attack. It's his turn to attack. It's his his combat uh, technical definition. In combat, there are rounds of combat. Sometimes they're referred to combat turns. The problem is you've got your movement turns. It shouldn't be called a combat turn because sometimes they just say turn, and that's confusing. Combat rounds. There's rounds of combat. On round number one, there's no retreating. Both sides will get to fire in their turn. Any losses you take happen first. So if these guys all shoot and kill all the undead, the undead won't get a chance to attack. Uh, so that's one of the advantages of having these lettered troops that come first in the alphabet. <laughs> Higher number for firepower is better. You know, you, you have a better chance to hit. Higher steps the more pips you have the more dice you get to roll that's better but the letters the lower letter comes first just like you know an a comes first in the alphabet and then b and then c so so that which unit or groups of units get to shoot first is based on the letters so if your english is your first you know language you'll easily understand the, the alphabetical order if your first language is not english you, you're going to have to learn that, that, you know, A comes before B, B comes before C, C comes before D. I don't think there's any E's 
out there. Uh, there's no Ds as far as I know in the basic armies, but I believe there are Ds in the um, expansion sets. So this guy, each die needs a one or a two. He's got three strength. So I'm going to roll three dice. Now I'm not going to roll these all in front of you. If there's a really critical battle, like, yeah, this could be game winning or not. Then I'll pop the, uh, the thing on the screen, but for saving time. So roll three rolls, got a one, a two, and a four. So it actually generates two hits. Hits must go on the strongest in terms of steps first. These are all two steps, okay? You'll always want to take them on your weakest... <laughs> Let me rephrase that. Of the units with the highest pips, the number of steps, you'll want to eliminate your cheapest units, basically. There's nothing that says you have to. You could kill a skeleton and keep a zombies around, potentially. Now, why might you want to do that? Well, in some cases, when you're fighting in the desert, the fact that skeletons are, you know, have the little oasis symbol, the palm tree, they're desert folk. Fighting in a desert hex, they get a one plus one strength. These guys being amphibious, the little marsh symbol, fighting in a swamp hex, they get plus one strength. Now, there's not a swamp here, and we're near the desert, but we're actually fighting over here in this clear terrain in a city. Now, there are city folk in this game. These two armies do not have them. Okay? Uh, I believe it's the feudal army. Is it the dwarves? The dwarves have city dwellers? Uh, I can't remember. Um, but in this case, no one is getting a strength bonus for fighting in the city in the clear in this case. So two losses. So you take one off of this zombie. We're rotating it. So now the one pip, the name, remember, on the top, and one from this guy. We're not going to damage the skeleton because he has a C2. He costs more. He costs two gold per per pip. Because it's because he fights better. He 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 attacks at the C timing, but he has two firepower instead of one. So that was because of the ranger. Now the bees are gonna go. Alright. And you can roll each one separately, or if you have enough dice, you can roll them all together. So I'm gonna roll six dice that I got here, looking for ones, needing ones. Uh, they rolled none. So they rolled below average. On average, you'd expect one. Now, that's not a guarantee, remember, because each one at one six chance, sort of the expect results about one, but it's not guaranteed. You could roll, you know, five or six ones, you get really lucky, or you could roll none. That's, so that's, that's that. So now these guys get to finally shoot back. They took two losses. Could have been a lot worse. They, everyone could have died if the <laughs> Pixies rolled great. So... Now you can roll these in any order. It doesn't matter at this point because they've all done. It's time to shoot all the Cs. So we can figure out the total number of dice. This one has one pip left at firepower one. This one has one pip left at firepower one. This has two pips left at firepower two. So because I have different colored dice, I can roll this all at once or I can roll them separately. Okay, I'm going to use these dice for the one, one firepower zombies, one die each, because they only have a pip left. And there's a single skeleton that has two pips, two steps. He's going to hit on one or two. So when I roll these dice, these will hit on one or twos, and these will hit on ones. Now, just so you make sure you know what I'm, what I'm saying, I'm going to put this in view here. All right, so the black and red dice are going to hit on one or two. The other ones are hitting on one. All right, so that needed a one, okay? But the black and red dice needed one or twos, so we got 
one hit total. So here we go. We got three guys all with three pips. Okay. If we've been able to get a glader over here, we want we would want to lose him. He's only a one cost. However, this guy, if he was over there, if he was able to get there somehow, since he only has one pip, we wouldn't be able to sign the damage to him. If he had three pips, he'd be tied with all the rest, and we could choose him. If he had four pips in there, you'd have to put the damage on him. This is why these cheap units called arrow fodder, generically, this is why you want them. You want a bunch of these guys with you, even though they don't get a lot of dice, but if you have an, enough of them that are bigger, you can take your losses on them and they're cheaper to replace versus, you know, these pixies cost two points per step. This ranger costs four gold per step. Four gold per step. Can you see that there, upside down? <laughs> so, he's not there. So, obviously, we don't put the one pip on him. If they had rolled three damage, you'd go one here, one here, and then, oh, I'm going to have to take one on this guy. But we're not, so we lose one here. All right. So, that was one round of combat. Now, a reminder, we're not playing with the quote-unquote combat reserves rule, Okay. So that we're just we're not going to talk about it anymore. That, but just a reminder for those that are watching. Um, now, normally the player has a choice when it's their turn to take their combat. Act. When a unit has a chance to shoot, shoot melee fight, you may retreat instead. You can't do that in the first round. Combat round two or three, you have that choice. After three combat rounds, the battle's going to be over. Okay? Sort of. <laughs> if the attacker has... If one side or the other isn't eliminated or fully retreated by the end of round three, okay? If you get to the end of round three and it's still contested, it's a contested battle hex, still, the attacker must retreat. Okay? And the way that works for that must retreat after three combat rounds is you just say, okay, the the guy that's the attacker that was left, the defenders managed to hold and save the day. The attackers retreat and the defenders that won get to shoot a quote unquote pursuit round. Okay. It's a special fourth round. <laughs> so so the combat's only last three rounds. But what it really means is there's a fourth round that's breaks the rules of the initial three rounds. So the first round, you're exchanging combat. No retreats possible. Second round, you may, on your, your time when a block gets to fire, gets to shoot, gets to roll for damage, instead of doing that, you may elect to retreat. That is your option, normally. So things could be retreating incrementally. You don't have to retreat. You may you may have a force guy. You may decide, I'm going to retreat the weak guy or something. There's You can decide, or maybe, ah, you know, I don't want these guys to take down. I'm going to stay and fight, but I'm going to leave my weak guy behind. I'm going to retreat my stronger guys because I I want to preserve them, maybe. I mean, it's just an option. It might not make good tactical sense in this situation, but it may make in some. That's just an example. You get to case-by-case -case basis decide, you know, when a unit's ready to shoot in round two or three, instead of fighting, you may elect to retreat. Okay. Now, okay, that being said, <laughs> this scenario, this solitaire scenario with programmed rules for the undead, the rule for them is when they are at one step, they must elect to retreat. Not that first round. Remember, round three, you always fight. And so uh, somewhere someone asked a question like, well, in this scenario, if, you know, a un undead unit is only at one step, and you know it's going to have to retreat, do they still attack? And the answer is yes, they do. The rule is undead, regardless of their strength of steps, pips, will engage the nearest elves if they can reach them. And there will be fighting. There will be that first round, that first round of fighting the units are going to get to shoot. Now, <laughs> the poor zombies, you know, being seized, 
you know, if they're fighting these elves, they may run in there and just get killed. <laughs> they may never get a chance to shoot, but theoretically they will always get at least that first round because they will not retreat the first round. But right now we're in the second round of combat. These guys are going to retreat. They will not fight back in round two, but they might be dead because we're back to shooting again. We're back to the A's and the B's. Now, right now there's less strength here in the B's. Okay, but we're back to here. We're back to shooting with three steps of, well, since I'm here, I'll just leave it here. Ooh, one and a two. Again, two, two, two hits out of the three. Now, it's going to start here. One hit's going to go here. This is bigger, bigger in steps. Two pips, two steps. The first of these two damage will hit here. And then they can decide again. So the, I will get rid of the weaker guy, okay? So I'm going to put him aside. I'm going to move this out of the way. I don't need to see the rest at this point. Um, yeah, I'm going to put him here. I'm going to put him here so you can see him. <laughs> he's dead. He's not out at sea. But there's rules about building what, what, what the undead will build. So we're, why not keep him handy there? Because he can... Rebuild these guys. These guys I have sitting over here, these armies that were not in the start for the dead, the Necrom and the Varang, uh, the, the cavalry unit, they do not come into play at all in this scenario. They're not in the mix, where unlike the, the elves, they've specific, specifically said in the rules that two gladers and a castle are available as builds. All right, so we're jumping the gun a little. We're, we're foreshadowing the upcoming uh, build phase. But he shot. So now they're down here, weak, weak, weak. Now they're to the pixies. The pixies have three and two pips. So we only have five total, but we can roll all five dice at once. They're B1s. They can shoot at the same time. And I got five dice. So I'll roll them. Looking for ones, only ones. This time, they finally did get a hit for one of those five. So one more here. Bingo, this guy gets hit. So two, two undeads. Both the zombies are dead. It's now the undeads turn to shoot, but they're not. What, what, you said, wait, wait, wait a minute. You said the guys that had one. Well, he started with two pips, but he is now at one pip. It is his turn, and he's going to retreat because he's at one pip. <laughs> If he still had two pips and these guys were killed off, but that's not possible the way that if none of these guys had rolled any hits, these two ones would now retreat and he'd be left at a two. The fact that he got hit and whether these guys, he is going to retreat. He's now at one, he's retreating, and these guys got killed. All right, so you have to pay attention to where they came from. That's... Sometimes you want to, like, leave them. You cannot retreat through a place where an enemy came into the hex. And normally, if you started in the hex, you can retreat out any direction except where the enemy came from. And if you entered the hex, like, in a defensive response, like he did... In this guy, you must try. You must try to retreat back the way you came. Okay, that's the number one preference. So the the rules for skeletons, skeleton, all undead retreating in this game are retreat to a friendly hex first, a neutral hex along the road in preference in any case, and you know following the rules like back where you came from. But if there's uh, if there's some option, you're going to retreat towards an undead city. Friendly. And these are still friendly. They they abandon them, but they're in the undead territory. So these are still controlled by the undead. Um, but this guy who's who's in this hex is going to retreat and he's going to just go there. Now, I believe, and I'm going to have to check this. So I check. You you always retreat to an adjacent hex. You retreat to an adjacent hex, except. As often there's there's uh, exceptions, and flyers are often the exception. Flyers may elect to retreat instead of just going adjacent. They may 
retreat up to their full movement allowance. I just didn't say two there. That's because there exists in this game some three movement allowance flyers. All these flyers right here have, have two. So the flyers can elect to retreat to adjacent X, or in this case, these guys could go two into a friendly hex. You couldn't retreat two away to a neutral hex. I couldn't retreat back here or something like that. Now, he's not a flyer, so he's going to go to a, a friendly hex. He's going to go back the way he came. He came in through this desert, and he's going to go here, right? So there is this skeleton. Here are these elves left alive. They don't have to retreat. They've taken the place. And are we done? Well, yes, maybe. There's a very, very important notion in this game that after you finish a combat, each combat, in order, the winner can regroup. Regroup is a special form of movement, and you do it after each combat. If you had three combats potentially going, you'd finish one combat and decide how to regroup there. And then you go to the next combat and see who wins there, and the winner gets to regroup. So it could be a, a different person. The elves could win this one, and they regroup. And then the undead could win over here. This is a hypothetical. I'm just pointing. <laughs> then the, they regroup, and then over here you have another battle, and then you know it could be the undead or the... Thing. It's a case-by-case -case basis. E after each battle, the winner gets to regroup. So what does regrouping mean? Now, this is actually quite flexible and what regrouping is is the ability to have units in the the just resolved battle hex elect to stay there or move into an adjacent hex Or you can have adjacent hexes move into the victory hex. Okay? So in other words, if you had guys next to you, let's say you were, had, you'd, you'd been attacking up this way and they didn't all make it in there. Like, like, for example, there's that hex side limit. You could only get a certain number across and that you won. You could now move the rest in there because remember this here can have up to five. Okay? So let me let me let me re reread that for you. I'm just gonna read you what it says, regrouping. After a battle ends, the victor may regroup. This allows the victor to move any blocks from the victory hex to any adjacent friendly or neutral hexes, or add any adjacent blocks to the victory hex, any adjacent blocks. Hex side limits do not apply when regrouping. Because, because hex hex side remember, hex limits are always in effect for each side. You can't have more than that many of the hex value. When you're entering combat, you're limited by the hex side value. When you're regrouping, you're either moving into or out of here. You're taking guys out of here to an adjacent. Friendly, you know, you already have units there, or there's no... And it's like, so this, even though an enemy came from here, this is now neutral. So one of these guys could be placed here, here. Now, technically, this is adjacent. And it, 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 it does not say, it says... It says that the hex side limits do not apply. However... However, I'm going to reinforce forever and a day the notion that movement limitations of impassibility should be absolutely in force. Okay. Okay. It says add any adjacent blocks to the victory hex. I contend if you had a unit over here, like a glader, and if you remember, this is a all C hex side, there's no way, shape, or form that you should be able to move this guy as part of regrouping into here. He cannot move that way. He cannot do it. Okay, do not allow a regrouping to have someone move 
in a way that's impassable. It seemed like if he was here, he's actually coming all the way across the sea. Now, this guy flies. This guy flies. And in fact, that's what I'm going to do now. Okay. I am going to regroup following the, the, the partial. You can do this or that. And it's, it's interpretable as a logical or inclusive, not exclusive. It's not X or if you're a programmer or you've studied symbolic logic or whatever, it says you can move guys in here or you can move guys out to adjacent. You can take adjacent blocks in. You can have a, it could be either or or both. It does not exclude, does not say exclusive or. So potentially, like if this guy was here, you could have this guy come in and elect to have this guy go out, for example. You are regrouping, all right? Either or both of those should be allowed in a regroup, okay? And um, I'm, I'm saying it, it's, it's not written in the rules, but I'm saying no way, shape, or form should you allow an illegal move as part of regroup, okay? <laughs> Don't let you guys move to places that they couldn't normally move as part of regroup. But this guy can fly. Now, because he classed a movement spell, he wasn't able to move during the movement phase, but there's nothing that prevents you. It says explicitly that besides moving in the movement phase, you could also potentially be involved in retreats and or regroups. So it is possible to move and retreat. And the thing is, remember, you can retreat during the middle of combat. The elves could have potentially retreated. They could have elected to say, I'm going to have one of these pixies retreat instead of shoot. And in this particular case, they still would have won the combat. That pixie that retreated could then also regroup. He says, oh, I, I retreated him to here, but now I'm going to regroup him back in. <laughs> or, you know, you could, you could decide to do that. That's possible. You can move. You can also retreat. And you can regroup. And so this guy here, who in the movement phase cast a movement spell, was not actually able to move in the movement phase, but he can participate in a regroup. And because this Wakana, she's a flyer, I'm going to bring her into here. Okay? So, well, but you're abandoning that. I'm like, well, I am not garrison anymore, but this is friendly to the elves. I'll be able to get the point. But by doing this, I can potentially be in here and say, hey, I'm going to actually grow, use the two points here that I control this to, to beef this wizard back up. Because right now I think, mm, I want to keep my wizard potential up. In the future, I might not want to do that, but right now I'm going to get this person here for this next turn to start doing stuff. So we have finished the movement and combat portion of the very first turn. And we're going to do the build, and then we're going to stop this video. Okay, so this is going to be a how to play and play through the first turn. Then we're going to pick up another video with the second turn on. I'm not sure how long I got, but we will continue to be explaining. So it's going to be a, still a hybrid how to play and play through video. Okay. Um, but uh, we, 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 this, this will be big enough <laughs> with all this pieces spliced together. This will be good enough. So let's, let's do the build now in the game, the base game, there are these counters. These are gold counters. They're double-sided. On the opposite side, you flip them over, and it's upside down. There's there's ones and twos. There's fives. If you flip it sideways, it'll be there. So one, twos, fives, and tens. Okay? These gold are, are gold that you get for each city. And if you're not spending it, you're leaving it on the map. Okay? And you still control it. You can save it up there. You cannot move these. Okay. These these markers, these gold markers cannot move. And if the enemy gets in there and takes your city, they can capture this undefended loot. Now, there are treasure blocks. There's silver, gold, and gems, I believe. There's treasure blocks as part of the expansions. We're not playing with that. I think there might be some in in the... the um, this used game that I bought, I remember seeing, I can't remember if it was a gold or a silver, 
but I'm not playing with those in this scenario this time. I'm going to play one later. When I said I'm going to use add the optional rule for combat reserves, I'll also let them be able to build uh, the treasure blocks. That allows you to move around money. Otherwise, you have to accumulate it in a city. And if you want to spend it, if you're not already there, you can you know build new guys there, or you can send a unit back to a place to then spend points to beef them back up. You know if they're if they're wounded, they've taken hits or you maybe built them low and never built them up, they can, can, they can build up, okay? So, all that being said, I'm gonna move these aside and start plopping them on here. So, obviously, right over here, there's gonna be one unspent point, unless I build. I can't build a castle, because it costs two. I could build a glader here, a one-point glader. I might as well do that. Uh, these can be useful, they can come over, start to fight. I mean, I could elect to save up money here to eventually have the wizard fly back and do it, but the fact that I, eh, yeah, I'm going to have this wizard come over here as part of regroup, and I wanted to emphasize that rule. It doesn't, I mean, they can fly across the water. This guy's adjacent, but it doesn't say that you shouldn't be able to move. Again, if this was not a flyer, you shouldn't be able to do that, just like a, a guy couldn't come here, so... Uh, that does not state it in the rules explicitly, but I'm 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 declaring that that's the case. It only makes sense to me. There's no sensibility to allow a regroup to do an otherwise illegal move across something that's impassable. All right. So here, this guy here is going to spend their one point to beef this block up. That's all you do. It costs one per step. I'm getting one. I'm going from a one to two. Over here, I'm going to go ahead and build a glader. He's going to be name up because that's one point. Here, these guys. Now, I'm doing the elves first. In the rules, you do simultaneously. Every play, you know, if you're playing a seven player game, everyone just spends their points simultaneously, right? Normally, you don't get to see what the guy's doing. Everyone is, you know, on the honor system. You're all your blocks are hidden. You know, you're only seeing the backs of the other guy's blocks. And you just do your builds. You do them all at the same time, and you're not going to know what he built. Now, you might be able to know that, hey, the only thing that's available is to build his glitter. Well, this guy's got a castle or not. You, you can sort of figure it out, but not necessarily. In a big game with a lot of guys, with lots of armies, you have no clue what in his mix of units that he bought or not, right? Very often, some of the some of the scenarios say you, you use exactly these units, like this one did. And some just say, hey, you got 50 gold pieces. Buy 50 gold pieces worth of army, Okay. That's what's fun about the sandbox nature of this. When you have those, you know, bonus expansion armies. Now, like I said, I'm not going to go out, if you saw my last video, I'm not going to go out and buy a ton of these expansion things because uh, that's an, uh, <clears throat> an addiction problem for me. I do not buy, quote unquote, collectible style games where things come at random. I have sworn off them. Magic, Magic the Gathering killed me. I, I, I was a total addict, and I've stopped that. I'm not going to do it. All right. But that's going to be a lot of fun. I, I, can, I can tell. I can just, I don't know. I'm just thinking about it, but no, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> if the, 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 the publisher is willing to send me some review copies, or if any of you guys want to donate, if you've got, and I, like I said, I'm pretty sure there's a fair number of, of these things in here. Uh, I mean, I saw some, these guys had their right amount, but there's also some duplicate armies of these things here. And then there was some things that, okay, these are obvious expansion armies. I don't know how many total there. I haven't sorted through all of them yet. But I, I, I believe there's hundreds <laughs> of different kinds of total blocks, right? <laughs> so so there's a lot of room to expand, potentially a lot of fun. You know, I'm not telling you not to go and collect them all, right? But... I'm not going to start down that road at all. All right. So we paid here. We paid here. Uh, we did this. I'm, so I'm not, I'm just doing it linearly. I'm doing all the elves. I'm going to do all the, the undead, especially for this scenario. That makes sense. Uh, but in a normal game, you all just do it simultaneously. You buy your stuff and you just, you know, you're on that system that you're not cheating. <laughs> you've, you've bought the right stuff. All right. So over here, we have two, two points. I could... With the two points, I could beef up this pixie back, or I can beef up this Wakana back. Now, she didn't get damage in combat, but she did spell, spent a spell point. I can beef that back. Or I could elect to, to buy a glader. 
Now, in some sense, it might be smart to start buying up a glader here. But if I could have bought one all the way up to four, I, I probably would to say, hey, I want to have a guy that, that can 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 take that first hit, be the biggest guy out there. He's cheap, and he's going to take the first hit. But I can only buy him up to two. So I'm not going to do it yet. I'm going to I'm going to play a little on the risky side. These guys are going to get beefed up, and they're I'm, I'm going to now start C moving it. Next turn, we'll start talking about C movement and stuff. Uh, but I'm not yet going to be. I'm, I'm going to do the, I'm going to do the the wizard thing. I want to be able to show you different kind of spells and stuff. So I'm going to beef up the wizard, regain that one pip, get up to four. That costs two total for that one pip. We spend all this money, this money, money. The elves have no money left. All right. The undead, they follow the rules of the scenario, okay? It tells them exactly how they build, okay? By priority, the undead must, per this scenario, they have to replace their dead blocks first, okay? Starting with the cheapest blocks. In this case, they lost two zombies, so it doesn't matter. They didn't lose any skeletons. They have a wounded skeleton, but... First thing they have to do is say, I need to replace these. Okay? Now, one of the things that it says is like, you know, move each undead one block at a time and decide where would he go? Is he going to move or not? They said there's potentially a lot of instances where the undead might have a choice. And this is like, well, where do we build these back? Each one of these places has a point, And it says... Well, roll it. Roll it randomly. Figure out what the quote-unquote odds are and always always grow back the dead guys first, starting with the cheapest ones. And then if all the blocks are on the map, then start to raise their strength. So... No, no, no new blocks. These guys are not allowed. No new blocks. Okay, rule number one. Eliminated under blocks must be rebuilt to strength one. And then any remaining points are spent on the cheapest blocks. So if there was a skeleton dead here, you'd bring the skeleton on. But then when you're saying, okay, now I've got all the dead guys not here, they're out there, you would go to... Increase steps of the cheapest guys. So you look at all your zombies first and try to put them up. So we're going to start with one of these guys to replace. There are one, two, three, four. Now, uh, someone said once in a in a in a video of this that you put it on the empty places first. No, you don't. It does not say that. It says you must start with the dead blocks first, starting with the cheapest. And then it doesn't give an order of precedent. Therefore, that general rule that says, you know, instances of undead choices must be resolved with a die roll, such as retreat hexes, building, or a hex that has a hex head limit, et cetera. But it's like, this is a decision on where I would bring this unit in. So one, two, three, four. We're going to roll. We roll five or six. We're going to roll again. But that's what we're going to do. We're going to roll it. And I'm doing one, two, one, two, clockwise from here, Kreba. So one, two, three, four. Rolled a one. So he is going to go to Kreba. So he'll build here one step, and that does take up his gold. Now, what I should do to make sure, you know, I should probably in this case, because we got this random major, I should put their money on here. And there's, uh, I'm going to put three, I could put a two and a one here. This, this is a three. This is a nice juicy three. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to do this because because of this thing. I don't know where these are going to come on yet. I'm following the rules of the order of precedent. So he came on here. So he spent the one. Okay. If we were trying to bring on a skeleton that costs two, I would not randomize these because these guys here only have one unless they had something stored up. Okay. If they had something stored up and they're getting new income, they could potentially bring on a skeleton for two. But in this case... They only have one right now, so we can bring on zombies, but we wouldn't skeleton. So if I had a skeleton, he'd have to come on here. But with these results of our combat, he's coming on here. There's money. So there's now no more money left here. So we say, ah, I got this guy to bring on. Where does it come on? Well, 
there's only three places left. So I'm going to go one, no, not here, here. <laughs> one, two, three, four, five, six. So we're going to roll one, two, three, four, five, six. And roll a one, two. So he does come. So in this case, they did happen to come on on the empty spots, now defending these things. All right. But it could have been here or here for, you know, both of them couldn't have right here, but both of these guys could have ended up being gone here because that's that's the random choice nature of this. So that's some of the the, the replayability in this. You know, what do you do as attacking as the elves? What decisions do you make about casting spells or not? What are the combat results? How many people died? How many hits you take? And where do the undead build or not? There's some randomness in that. And that'll help playability if you want to play this more than once. And I highly recommend you play this scenario until you win it, okay? This is not going to teach you necessarily how to play against another player with the hidden blocks. There's a lot to learn about the nuances there of dealing with the uncertainty. But in terms of mastering the mechanics, play this until you win it, okay? So now we're not done, the undead. The undead have money left, Okay, they're not going to do anything here and here. But now we can just go per each space and say, well, there's one gold here. Can I build anything? This guy is a guy that costs one. So he can. He started with two. Like, remember, these all started the game at two pips. But, you know, we're able to only afford one pip here, one pip here. This guy's at two pips. We have one gold here. We're going to put him up to three. So that's the decision there. All right, here we are. Here we are at Bethy. We have three gold. We have two different units. We have no more units to replace and build. We got two guys. They both happen to cost two each. Castles cost two. Skeletons cost two. They're not at max. And so what is the rule that it says? For building for undeads, mm, remaining undeads are spent on the cheapest block first and saved only if no building is possible. Cheapest block, they're both the same price. So what do we do? We roll. We randomize. Okay, here's a decision. I could do either one. How does he resolve it? We go to the dice. So I'm going to say even or not. Okay, even will be the skeleton. Odd will be the castle. I rolled even a four. So the skeleton. Goes up by one. Okay. Now, if you were playing this as the undead yourself, you'd probably put the castle up because the castle, even though it can't move, this is the whole object of the game. Then it killed the castle, and the castle has a C4 strength. C4. So while it still shoots in the C speed, this, the, the, the point of the order of shooting, each time it shoots, it can kill on a one, two, three, four. Okay, so getting the castle up, less likely to get killed, and boom, stronger punch uh, when it does shoot. But in this case, this now, what does this mean? This guy's stronger, so as the elves try to advance, and oh, these these units are going to attack, counterattack. They're going to, you know, depending if if you know where the elves are, sometimes the elves might just move up in the open, and these undead might just have to attack them, and sometimes the Elves are attacking other undead and other undead. Like, this is three down the road. If they come over here to attack, guys are going to move from both these. One, two, three. One, two, three. Off this road. Okay? And so the fact that this guy beefed himself up, that can help their, their fighting. Uh, but you know, the castle didn't get stronger for defensive purposes, but we will see. Again, good replayability. Okay, so... Now we are done. No, we're not. We've, we, we, we built this guy. We spent two. And we say, oh, I got one left to spend. I can't. I cannot spend it right now. Okay. There are no zombies to build. And the units that are in here right now. But we will save up one. We have one. So next turn, they'll get to collect three and they'll have four total. So ooh, yeah, two of these guys, or they might have to build zombies though. If zombies are dead. So some of these zombies get killed. So sometimes that's a elven strategy. Something like, hey, I want to kill them. I want to make sure, I want to make sure, <laughs> I don't want them to necessarily 
beef up the, the best units here. I want them to keep, you know, maybe rebuilding those cheap units. All right. So I'm going to zip up here a little bit. I'm going to zoom in. So this is the state of the game here. After one turn, new Elven unit, one pip later, this one is advanced. They have invaded here. They succeeded. Uh, they are currently down one pip on a pixie. The wizard was able to rebuild. So they are stronger glader-wise. They have an extra glader unit, and this one's stronger, but the pixie's down one. The undead have all their units back. However, they're zombies. This one and this one are only at one pip. As of the two they started, this skeleton's down a pip. He's sitting in the desert right now. So what happens to him next turn? That is going to depend on what these guys do. In his turn, if they stay here, he will attack. If they come out and attack him, well, he'll just sit there and this guy will come to defend him. Now, earlier you said, meandering Mike, if there was if there was a zombie here, they couldn't... Well, a zombie can move into the desert one hex. You have to stop. So if these elves come here to attack, this zombie could come out to fight there. So we will see what happens. We will decide what the elves do next turn. So, meandering Mike, Man Cave of Madness... Signing off now of this first turn, of the how, how to play and first turn discussion of Wizard Kings, second edition. This is second edition. Uh, scenario is the Island of the Dead, the recommended solitaire scenario, depending on which version of the 2.0 rules, there's still 2.0, it might actually be scenario 7.1, or it might be your 7.3, even they call it 7.1. I explained all that. <laughs> little, little, little silliness in the numbering of the scenarios. So I want you all to take care, folks, and remember to take care of your games because they'll take care of you. Ciao.